Hi, everyone. Welcome again. This is our final lecture in this year's event for the UNM Institute of Medieval Studies. It's the first annual Helen D'Amico Memorial Lecture Series and the 35th annual Spring Lecture Series for the IMS. And we're delighted to bring you our topic, Medieval Performance. Again, I wanna just point out that I'm so grateful for your patience with this very new format in Zoom webinar and your flexibility with um, coming to these lectures online and as always participating as such a great audience that you are. Um, if you are interested, if you missed the first two lectures, they are both on our YouTube channel. Um, that's UNM IMS YouTube channel for Carol Symes and Karen Silen's talks. We of course wish that we could meet in person. We look forward to that and we all cross our fingers that that's going to happen quite soon. Um, but we continue to be connected to our home at the University of New Mexico. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on traditional homelands of Pueblo Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations, and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. This is the first lecture series as it's been newly dedicated to our founder and colleague, Helen D'Amico. In 1986, Dr. D'Amico founded the annual spring lecture series and the Institute for Medieval Studies here at UNM. Dr. D'Amico directed the Institute until 2002 and the lecture series ran annually until it was postponed in 2020 because of COVID-19. We're excited to reintroduce the series here with its new dedication to Helen, who passed away in April, 2020. We remember Helen through this series for her dedication to bringing medieval studies to students and friends in Albuquerque, New Mexico and beyond. Because the series was postponed from last year, our funding structure changed a little bit, but that doesn't mean I still don't want to really appreciate and thank all the departments and administrative units who have contributed to this series over the years and supported us and encouraged us in this great event for IMS. I also wanna thank the previous director, Dr. Timothy Graham, who really pulled together this group of speakers and um, theme and unfortunately could not run it last year because of the COVID-19 outbreak. But I do wanna thank him for all the groundwork that he laid for this um, conference, this series. And of course, thank all my great friends, medieval colleagues in the IMS steering committee for their help and encouragement in putting this together. And thank all our students, friends of medieval studies and everyone in our audience. Remind you that it is to you that Helen wished the ideas, excitements and intrigue of the Middle Ages be spread. And I hope that your imaginations will be sparked and you'll keep coming back for events that engage you with the complexities of the Middle Ages. So once again, before we get started, we have a couple things just to remind everybody about, things we call housekeeping. Zoom webinar does not have a chat function and you're all silent and invisible to us, but your presence is near and dear to us. We know you're there. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, anytime during the lecture. And at the end of his lecture, I will read the questions and Dr. Thomas will have an opportunity to answer them for you. Um, we'll also be recording this webinar. So in the coming weeks, you'll be able to find that link on our website and on our YouTube channel. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my great colleague, Dr. Jonathan Davis Secord um, from the English department who will introduce our tonight's speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrews. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Kyle Thomas, is an assistant professor of theater and dance at Missouri State University. Dr. Thomas received his PhD from the University of Illinois, where his dissertation was directed by one of our other speakers this year, Dr. Carol Symes. 
Dr. Thomas's research centers on the, historic, the history of theatrical performance in the Middle Ages. His forthcoming book, co-authored with Dr. Symes, is a new edition and verse translation of the play about the Antichrist. He also has extensive experience in directing postmodern theater with methods based on historical performance practices. He has produced performances of medieval drama at the Cloisters of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the Newberry Library in Chicago, among other venues. And he has received funding support from the Mellon Foundation. His presentation for this year's lecture series titled Medieval Theater in Modern Spaces will discuss the methods, techniques, and mimetic practices required by medieval plays. Drawing upon his own experience of directing the play of Adam at the Met Cloisters and the play of the Antichrist at the University of Illinois, he will demonstrate how the plays resonate with modern transformational visions for space, society, and story. Before I hand the screen over to Dr. Thomas, in this moment when we are recreating our vibrant community of Albuquerque medieval studies, gathering virtually from many disparate physical spaces, I think it is useful to share a quotation from Dr. Thomas. Quote, theater requires the interrogation of that relationship between performance and audience, an act in transcending space to promote the sacred bonds found in community, end quote. Dr. Thomas, take it away. Thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And a big thank you to the uh, Institute for Medieval Studies at the University of New Mexico uh, for inviting me. I am honored to be here and to be uh, a part of such a prestigious company um, with colleagues uh, who have spoken before uh, me this evening. Um, I'd also like to say a very special thank you to Dr. Tim Graham for inviting me um, last year. And, and though we were not able to gather at that time, I'm also very grateful uh, to Dr. Justine Andrews for um, picking up the baton and carrying it through into this year. And although we cannot be together in person, I'm just very, very honored and grateful to be here uh, speaking with all of you this evening. So my talk tonight is on medieval theater in modern spaces. Um, I wish to uh, tell you a little bit, not only about the productions that I've directed, but the research that uh, is currently underway and that I have been a part of for some time. Um, let me see if I can move the screen forward. There we go. Uh, this is, it, it, as mentioned in the introduction, a bit of a shameless plug here. Um, much of the work that I uh, brought to this particular talk uh, comes from a, a long, um, over a decade's worth of research and study and, and contemplation over the so-called Ludus de Antichristo, the play about the Antichrist from the 12th century. Uh, the surviving manuscript exists from the monastery, the Imperial Abbey at Tegernsey, which is in southern Bavaria. And uh, uh, Dr. Carol Symes and I have, have um, had many, many years to, to look over this text and, and really uh, excavate as much of it as we can. Um, and so you will you get a little bit of a preview of some of what will be in that particular book uh, coming out hopefully uh, within the next year or so. I should also mention that I am coming to this talk as this squarely from the academic discipline of theater. Uh, though I am a medievalist, um, I am housed within the Department of Theater and Dance here at the at Missouri State University. And um, I, I, I approach the, the study and history of medieval drama in the Middle Ages more broadly from the perspective of someone who did not have a very good history in that particular period, especially when it comes to the theatrical um, uh, scripts and, and experiences and phenomena from that period. I think this is a pretty common experience for a lot of young theater st students uh, who are in college and those even working theater artists today. I am very interested in seeing this particular period of history and of theater history um, develop a stronger uh, or, or, or more grounded narratives that can be useful to not only theater historians and, and historians more broadly, but also to theater practitioners. 
when it comes to deciding what types of plays to be performed within a particular season, be it in an academic theater department or even a professional theater company, uh, medieval drama provides a, a, a source of a lot of really fascinating material, but it also really challenges us as theater artists to think very differently about the way that performance works, that the way that meaning is transmitted to audiences through common experiences, rituals, practices, and even spaces. And so this is truly an area of research that I hope will resonate beyond just the, the field of history or literature and, and particularly resonate with, with theater artists and theater specialists and, and practitioners out there. And, and I hope that uh, my work as a theater practitioner, as a professional actor and director, uh, better informs the historiography of this period as well as how to develop particular narratives surrounding surviving medieval texts, but also just how to kind of dig deeper into medieval uh, performance more broadly so that we can begin to find um, not only narratives, but examples of how this material can be very useful for current students and artists within the world of the theater arts. And so that will be a little bit of the insight that I work from today as uh, I talk a little bit about performing these particular plays. But first I'd like to mention that there are really kind of two, two big broad problems that I am uh, attacking from, with this talk. And again, largely this centers around my work within the, the discipline of theater more specifically, um, but, it are, but it still permeates within the field of medieval studies. And, 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 and unfortunately there are some difficulties even with other medievalists about how to best approach this material. And there are two big problems that I want to articulate at the start of this talk this evening. The first is about audience assumptions and expectations in regard to medieval drama. This is particularly true uh, in, in the field of theater, largely because of the, the, the bad theater history that, that is still so ubiquitous um, in our teaching and in our scholarship and, and in our scholarly understanding of the history of European theater. Um, generally, the perception is that medieval drama is substantively religious to the point that it's preachy. And what is being preached are simply Bible stories. Uh, they're, they're the, you know, Noah and the flood, Adam and Eve, and those sorts of stories that were only meant to be uh, a part of this larger culture where because of a, a significant amount of Ill, Ill, illiteracy, people needed theater to be able to learn about the Bible, which is, is as we know, not true. Um, of course, these plays have uh, themes, characters, ideas that are uh, misogynistic and anti-Semitic. That is, that is not news to any of us. Um, I know that we, we all are challenged and, and struggle with that material uh, in a lot of ways. But unfortunately, there's kind of this sense that medieval drama is more so that than in any period of theater history, which uh, for those of us who, who venture into the areas of classical drama or into pre-modern or early modern drama, such as that of Shakespeare, we know that uh, those plays and that material can, can share in the same misogyny and anti-Semitism uh, that, per that permeates a lot of medieval drama as well. And yet, those plays and those materials are better understood and are often produced more often, much more often than what you see uh, for medieval drama. And then lastly, again, I think this is just generally a part of the kind of cyclical nature of where uh, our theater history studies tend to be. There's a sense that, that the Middle Ages and medieval theater do not con contribute much to modern theater aesthetics or practices and therefore aren't really important for our uh, burgeoning theater artists to learn about. Um, hopefully all of those assumptions may be at least reversed or somewhat tackled by the end of my talk this evening. Secondly, uh, one of the second problem I want to draw your attention to is a relatively uh, opaque or ambiguous documentary record when it comes to teasing out what is and is not within the greater canon of medieval drama. Um, surviving text, the question is, is or is it, is it or isn't it a play? That's essentially kind of the, the question that is uh, difficult to unpack and certainly has been a big part of uh, a lot of the work of, of recent scholars as we begin to talk about and, and develop the, the history of medieval drama. In particular, I would like to uh, point your attention to the third bullet point under that, where um, 
you know, a, 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 one of the, the challenges that, that I have faced in wanting to stage and work with medieval drama, either in the classroom or as a work of performed material, uh, the, a lot of the translations and editions that exist of medieval, that are, are out there and been published uh, for existing medieval plays, tend to really promote the literary value and the literary aspects of the play. This is not to say they are bad translations. They certainly are not. Um, some of the greatest, you know, and particularly Latin scholars have, have lended their, their knowledge and their abilities and skills to these translations, yet they don't necessarily speak well in performance. And that's a key aspect that when a, a, a student or a theater, an actor or a director picks up a, a script, they are looking for something that they can quickly find connection with and that they can almost speak themselves out loud and, and use as a source of saying something uh, for contemporary audiences today. And much of the translations and editions that we have focus more on the kind of historical aspects of the uh, source material, as well as trying to um, provide a very, you know, quote unquote, accurate translation uh, for those who are studying the, the uh, Latin text. And in my case, I, I work mostly with medieval Latin drama. So in getting at some of these uh, problems that I have come across, and some, albeit a bit anecdotally, within my own research and my own work, uh, there are three particular topics I would like to uh, address in this talk this evening. Um, first, we are going to be looking at a dramaturgy of space and working in what we consider non-traditional spaces. Uh, in the theater world, we sometimes also call these found spaces, but these are essentially spaces that were not necessarily conceived of or, or built for theatrical performance, even though they may to some degree have been built for some aspect of performance. Um, but this is really important because, you know, especially when we're dealing with early medieval drama, Latin medieval drama, we are largely dealing with a form of drama that was not written for a proscenium arch. Uh, we are dealing with uh, theaters that were themselves spaces that were constructed for other purposes. Again, although performance may be a, a, a significant function of that space, theatrical performance is something a little different. And so we have to be able to understand that, that when we're looking at medieval plays or when we're studying medieval plays, we are studying work that is not meant to be framed and, and viewed in the same way that we, we view theater today or have uh, for the last uh, few hundred years. Secondly, we will look into insights into documentary practices for scripted drama in the Middle Ages, in particular, um, catechological contexts and what other manuscripts might be bound together with extant medieval plays and how those other manuscripts and materials can help uh, reveal or inform or unpack aspects of the drama that we might miss simply by only studying the play. And then lastly, I would like to talk about methods and approaches for performing medieval drama. Um, we are largely working outside of aesthetics that are naturalistic or realistic, which are very much the kind of center of theater and drama today. Um, you may hear me use the term psychological realism. This is generally the, the type of theater that was the most popular throughout the 20th century, still remains popular today. Um, and it is the type of theater and, and type of aesthetic or approach that uh, undergirds most of the actor training and theater training that is done today. But yet, as, as especially after this last year, as you may know, we, we need to be able to begin to bring in new approaches to theater that, uh, that are, are not really focusing on naturalism or realism as a means of mimetic representation, but finding new aesthetic uh, ways to not only convey meaning and ideas, but reach, to, reach an audience, engage them, entertain them, and create an, a work of art that is holistic and compositional. And I will talk more about that once we get to the end. But first, let us look at uh, a dramaturgy of space and the aesthetic reach of the world of the play. So I, I should stop here for just a second and, and, and define a little terminology for you. I, I do not wish to assume that everyone out there knows what, what I mean when I use the term dramaturgy. This is my particular definition here. Uh, dramaturgy from my conception is the conditions which drive dramatizations of stories and or rights for theatrical treatments manifested in both textual and performance settings. I really like what Turner and Barrett say in their work, Dramaturgy and Performance, 
um, by saying that dramaturgy is a means by which to excavate a work's architecture. And so when we are looking at medieval plays, we are looking at medieval drama, we must consider the performative milieu, the performative context that, uh, that, that would have influenced the shape and, and even the writing of that drama, both as a text, but also in terms of its performance. And so we have to, dramaturgy is an, an analytical frame by which we can begin to explore the exteriors of the work and its margins and kind of its greater networks and, that it was in communication with. So surviving medieval plays uh, uh, operate with an expectation that readers have some knowledge of the cultural conventions for, for performance that come out of these familiar spaces. Uh, this is not too dissimilar from the expectations uh, for the way that playwrights write their plays today. If you were to pick up a copy of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, uh, you would get a wonderful description of settings and scenery that, that go into that particular world of that play that's important to understand for the character of Willie Loman and how he is interacting with his family and with his coworkers and so on and so forth. But you wouldn't read about, you know, Miller doesn't provide information about, oh, this should be done in a proscenium theater with exactly 250 seats and so many fly lines and those other aspects of, of theatrical architecture that can be important uh, in terms of the performance of the play. But somehow there seems to be this expectation that we should have information about the performance space in medieval texts. And maybe this comes a little bit from our early modern uh, studies of, of Shakespeare's talk, Shakespeare talking about the wooden O in Henry, where you have uh, a description of the actual physical space in which the, the, that uh, is the theater, or opening up the casements that would have been done in Midsummer Night's Dream as a way to bring more light in, but was also an indication that the Blackfriars Theater had casements so that air and light could be brought in as well. We don't have this in most of our medieval drama. And so there shouldn't be this expectation that the script is somehow going to tell us the, the way that the space should be utilized for performance. Uh, that's very frustrating, but it is certainly something that we need to accept from the beginning of this process. So in order to really kind of uh, excavate this work's architecture and interpret uh, surviving, a surviving medieval script, there's three things we must do. One, put aside our conventional thinking about space uh, and how it may be utilized for performance. At, at what Dr. Carol Symes said in her talk last Thursday rings true here. Any space and every space in the Middle Ages was a space for performance and often was utilized in some way for performance. And how might that performance been, have been enhanced or infused with aesthetic uh, qualities that would, trans, would trans, uh, transcend it into theater? That's a different, uh, that's a, an important part of thinking about how these spaces could be layered upon um, to make and construct meaning out of surviving existing functions and the way that uh, people interacted with that space on an everyday basis. Number two, we must examine uh, information from a text that uh, information that a text provides about the world of the play. When I teach script analysis, we often talk very much about the world of the play. Uh, this is a world that might look very, very much like our own and may function in ways that are very similar to our own, but it is not our own. In the, court, in the case of medieval drama, uh, the dramatists, authors, and scribes who are creating these texts are thinking in a very similar way. They are working to create a world that is perhaps similar to their own, but uh, infused with some differences or with some variation that is meant to create meaning or meant to touch an audience or speak to an audience in very particular ways. So the, we have to ask ourselves to how different is the world that is being constructed within this play from the world of uh, the author, the, the dramatist, or the, the, the community that is creating this play? Is it very similar? Is it very different? And where we do see differences, what do those differences potentially mean? And then lastly, we must investigate didactic information and rubrics that are in these scripts for an authoritative or instructional gaze. Essentially, how and where should we look and how does the text capture that sense of helping us look and, and see in certain ways? In these uh, two particular photos here, these are both from our 2016 production of the Judah Adam, the play of Adam. 
uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Cloisters, which is in New York City. And the, this performance occurred at, in the 12th century Fuente Duena Chapel, which is a uh, largely uh, um, extant uh, apse from a monastic community in, in Fuente Duena in, in modern day Spain. And the, the building was brought over piece by piece, brick by brick, and reconstructed in New York. For our production, uh, we laid out the space uh, along what is known as an aisleway configuration. So you can see here uh, the chairs on either left and, and right uh, of, the, of the actual structure itself. Now, this was done largely because um, we wanted to try and utilize as much as the space as possible because if you've been to the cloisters, it does feel like it's a big spacious uh, uh, building and structure, but, but when we try to fit the uh, you know, folding chairs and, and some platforms and then scenery and lights and all of that, it, it shrinks very, very quickly. Um, we were able to fit about an audience, I believe uh, between 100 and 110 people into this space. Um, but the configuration also mirrors the idea of, of a lot of the way, a lot of ways that churches are laid out architecturally, and particularly the emphasis that a lot of Latin medieval drama places on processions and processional. Um, that becomes a big part of a lot of medieval plays, especially those that contain liturgies. And so this allows for that processional space to uh, be open and exist and, and to kind of dominate the way in which we block the play, the way that we construct the movement of the actors and the, and the, and the means by which they might interact with their audience. Um, you, you cannot see it in this picture, and I'm sorry, I don't have one, uh, a picture of it in this particular presentation, um, but just behind the, the viewer in, in both of these pictures, uh, so behind you essentially, there was the entrance to this particular part of the museum uh, that we layered. It was a beautiful portal that was extant with this space. Uh, we, we put a hellmouth covering over it. Um, and again, that, that kind of signals this sense of the progression of both time, space, and geography or cosmography, cause, uh, uh, this kind of layout of the universe in a way that we have you know, hell and a hellmouth or the entrance to that on one end of the space as we move through the space, through the audience and the playing area, we move closer to the apse itself, which is in where there's no altar here. In place of that, we have this beautiful um, garden that is to represent the Garden of Eden for most of the play. And then the rest of the apse behind it, and I will speak to that actually momentarily. But I want to point out on the image of the left, on the left, um, something that became very important about this performance was the idea of layering onto space. Um, you know, I, I know that, that, that some scholars will use the word transform. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with that lexical usage, but I like the idea more so of, of layering, that the space, uh, the use of the space, the function of the space, the experience with the space, uh, the phenomenon of the space itself does not really change in performance as much as performance layers on top of it what is already there and ties into those experiences those ideas and that communication that has long been happening before the performance ever begins. In this case, you can see on the image on the left, um, Adam is uh, staring ahead of him. This is early in the play when the devil has come to Adam and, and is trying to convince him to eat of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that, that, that God has said he should not eat of. And you can see here in the vertical space, uh, the devil below the crucifix hanging from uh, up well within the apse. And it is a, it's as if Adam is quite literally visualizing his choice. He can choose to, to follow the devil and the temptation that the devil is providing uh, in eating that fruit and, 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 the, and the wisdom and the knowledge and the godlike status that the devil is promising Adam there. And the crucifix above, which kind of embodies the, the importance of, of following God and following uh, your Lord and making sure that you keep his promises and the blessing and, you know, and, and the hoped for blessings that will be, that will come of that. And so the devil is able to take this gesture and, and, and signal the same kind of sense of, of, of leadership and godliness that is captured in the crucifix above. It is, it is signaling to Adam that this space is also communicating to you. And I am aware of that and yet I am still going to ask you a question and, and force you to make a choice. In the image on the right, 
Um, this is the moment, this is the, uh, at the end of the show, for, for those of you who may know this play, uh, it, it, it does survive from a, um, a 13th century, early 13th century manuscript um, that is fragmentary. We do not have the end of the play, it has not survived. Uh, so we made the choice that we would end it with the Annunciation, uh, given that the play has a lot of themes and, and liturgical moments that are really borrowed from the Advent season or the Christmas time season, uh, we felt that it was appropriate to end with the Annunciation, although the Epiphany may have been uh, just as easily a choice that we could have uh, made as well. I think this was a little bit more manageable given our resources and our actors. But you can see that we still keep with the Epiphany because in the back of the church, and I apologize if it is hard to see, but in the back of the church at the very top of the apse is a fresco that is uh, uh, capturing the, um, the moment of Epiphany. You can see um, the Archangel Michael is on the left, the Archangel Gabriel on the right. It looks like two Magi is also there with um, uh, Gabriel. And then the Virgin and Child are our center. And again, we have this sense of the space being progressive in terms of time and its connection to the Christian calendar and the Christian uh, uh, cosmology as well that we again we start on one end with this sense of the of death and the and the world that is thereafter always around us and always existing with us moving through the sacred space toward the altar through and into the apse um, where there is uh, uh, both the crucifix the the uh, beauty of the altar piece the promise of of, of, of heaven that is captured in the garden and then above that and looking down is the virgin and child from this moment of epiphany, but yet in the midst of it, we are performing actually the Annunciation. These are all connected in the Christian world and in the medieval mind. And so therefore, um, it's, it's as if this layering is also gesturing to the understanding of the universe, the way that it's laid out, the Christian life, Christian theology, and Christian practices and beliefs that would have been um, a big part of the monastic life in particular, but just Christian life generally from this time period. In the, in the performance there, you can see uh, the actress who is, is uh, clothed in kind of a traditional way that Mary often looks with her, ha her hands clasped together, uh, her, her, slate, her face slightly down in respect, the angel Gabriel there in front of her, um, kneeling to her, but also looking to her in reverence, and our two angels out in the audience, uh, both giving a, a knee in respect and reverence to the Virgin as well. Um, in my work with, uh, well, I should say that, that the play about, of Adam uh, ha contains a, a numerous, what we might consider stage directions, didactic information that helps instruct us as to the performance. And similarly, the, the play of the Antichrist, play about the Antichrist, the Ludus de Antichristo, does a very similar thing. The play actually opens with this description here of the playing space, how things are supposed to lay, be laid out. I draw your attention particularly to the first sentence the temple of the Lord and seven royal seats, which in Latin is sedes, should be set up in this manner at the beginning. In the east, the temple of the Lord and grouped around it, other seats, other uh, allegorical representations of worldly powers and authorities. Um, as, I mentioned, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, this play is extant in a manuscript that uh, comes from Tegernsey, the, uh, the Imperial Abbey at Tegernsey. Uh, and is now, is now housed at the uh, Bavarian State Library in Munich. Um, but Tegernsey is very important because of its connections to, uh, or at least its desire to have stronger connections with the imperial court of Frederick Barbarossa, the Holy Roman Emperor in roughly the middle to the late part of the 12th century. Um, and clearly the play is beginning with this kind of description of how things should be laid out and these other temporal uh, and ecclesiastical powers that are going to be very important to this particular play and its plot. And this is roughly how that might look uh, according to those uh, particular stage directions. This is a bit of a ground plan and you can see there that, that everything is oriented toward the east, toward Jerusalem uh, and the temple of the Lord. Um, and then everything is kind of centered uh, in, in particular cardinal directions around that. Um, this opening description of the playing space in, in the Ludus Sancti Cristo is actually informed by the monastic education, the cloister schools work with compass wind charts, and uh, this undergirds this cosmography in which, uh, as Barbara Obst, ident uh, Obst identifies, quote, winds, acts as direct, winds act as direct agents of God, 
carrying out his will, sometimes as messengers. So while the royal seats and their allegorically embodied authorities are fixed into space, the projection and transmission of authority are affected actually by the various messengers, ambassadors, emissaries, armies, and other individuals that are a part of this play who would be moving around the space, delivering a message from one king to another, from the emperor to the king of the Franks, and then so on and so forth, as well as armies, because this, this play has armies that clash and battles to be fought. And that would probably happen in an open space around these seats uh, and these kind of stationary um, places where these, these uh, the royal figures, um, allegorical figures would have been standing. So these, uh, the figures that aren't really named, that are just kind of grouped individuals, uh, they would take most of the dramatic focus due to their constant movement and also likely because they share the same level as the audience. The royal seats are elevated and command the vertical space, but the moving messengers master the horizontal or floor space, drawing the eyes of the audience with them and enabling direct interactions. This immersive and multidimensional theater experience is at once strikingly postmodern, but also truly medieval in its mimetic construction of the Teganzi monastic space. After all, Teganzi had strong connections to ecclesiastical and lay courts across, the 12, across 12th century Europe in a play that centers its performed actions on the movement of ambassadors and all those other grouped figures would make for an effective teaching tool in the, in the monastery's cloister school. Now, I, I really love this kind of ground plan here, but in my staging of it in 2013, I didn't really keep with that. And, and there's uh, several reasons for that. Some of it's just logistic. Um, the, uh, the, this is, I'd only just begun really working with the play at this point and hadn't, and was kind of teasing out certain other aspects of it, uh, that were a, a little different from, from trying to match in, uh, the ground plan as it was relayed in the, in the stage directions in the surviving text. Um, I wanted to focus on the movement of these ambassadors and emissaries and those type of ambassadorial groups of characters. Unfortunately, this play requires a really large cast of characters. Um, there are numerous named individuals, and then there are also just all of the other individuals that the script demands that, that take over these um, uh, grouped roles that can move about the space. So instead of having large groups of people moving, we use these banners that you can see here uh, and flags as a way to indicate that, okay, there's uh, the authorial power is moving through the space and taking with them this banner. In this particular uh, uh, scene here, um, you can see blood or, or red paint slashed across uh, the, some of the banners. Those are the banners who Antichrist, those are the banners of the, the particular powers that Antichrist has uh, defeated in battle or convinced to come over to his side. Um, in speaking about the kind of layered nature of space as well, uh, you see in the center of this picture and kind of the background or the back of the stage staging area, this massive brick, vertical brick structure. Um, this is a bell tower at the University of Illinois, and it, it is very, very large. It can be seen through uh, by just about anywhere on campus. It can certainly be heard uh, from just about anywhere on campus. And um, when it was being built, uh, it was constructed and finished shortly before I arrived at the University of Illinois in 2010. I believe it was finished in 2008 or 2009. Um, but it, it, during its construction, the majority of the brick structure had been completed, but there was still a, a bit of a, a, an upper structure that was still under construction. And during the evening, some students climbed up to the top of this bell tower and, and stretched a, a sheet or some type of fabric across the uh, support beams at the very top and painted the eye of Sauron on that bell tower so that it was, appeared to be looking out over all of campus uh, um, during its construction. And in a way, we're kind of gesturing to, the, to that, that, that history that most students knew or, or had seen who were still there when we performed this. Um, and, and just kind of speaking to that nature of being on a college campus where there is that sense of uh, the administration always being there, the buildings, the way that they look and kind of how everything is laid out. Uh, you are watched, you are, you are seen, you are a part of this kind of community in some way. And in the case of this uh, particular bell tower, it felt like you were being watched all the time when you have that eye of Sauron above it. But it gives that sense of 
this authority or this great kind of God-like character that is right there in the center of campus. And we were very lucky to be actually given access to the bell tower so that we could play the bells at the end of the play when, when Antichrist, as the stage direction says, is struck down quite suddenly by a great calamitous sound and he falls down dead. Uh, you can see Antichrist there in the center of the stairs uh, looking on uh, with the um, particular uh, actors there. But this, this arrangement of the space is really there to capture the, the sense of movement that would have been so important to the play and how the movement either speeds up the pace of the show or slows it down. So the, again, these characters who are not named characters but move in large groups very much control the kind of sense of speed, pace, and intensity that the play moves with. They are moving through what we call network space, a space in which they are trying to create and relay relationships between these various figures and powers. So just as an example of why um, Tegan C may be in, in, in interested, in a, interested in creating a play like this, you can see here in these particular um, uh, schematic uh, 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 reconstructions of the space that are, were done in the 1970s based upon some archeological excavations that were going on at the time, um, that there is certainly a, a real interest in how space is laid out and how space can kind of signal greater importance, grand design, cosm uh, cosmography and cosmology that are also important that are revealed in these spatial relationships. Um, in the image on the left, any of those red structures there uh, were structures that were surviving in, around the 16th century, possibly as early as the 15th century. Some of them may be even much earlier. It was just hard to determine in the archaeological record. But um, nonetheless, you can see just kind of how the complex was laid out. Never, and this church at the center of it um, was, is, is not really moved or, or technically changed a whole lot uh, over the centuries. It's still there today. But when you take on and, and look at the, uh, the layout of the, the ground plan that is described in the surviving text, you can see that it doesn't quite work. Um, we would imagine that the temple of the Lord in the east would actually be roughly where the altar of the church traditionally lies. And in the case of the church of Tegancy, uh, it is not laid out in that east-west pattern with the altar facing the east that was kind of common for Romanesque churches of this period. Um, and this may be why that the church, the, this actually, this opening description begins with the words templum domini. And we see that twice in these opening instructions. So we've, there's two indications of the temple of the Lord. So how are we to understand, are these two different temples of the Lord or what exactly are they? Um, in, in kind of working with this over the last few years, this is actually some of the later stuff that I, I got to in my um, research with this particular play. Um, we, we have to understand that the text is instructing that the following action must be framed as occurring within this conception of space, a, a, a sacred temple-like space, regardless of whether the performance actually took place in a church or not. The aesthetic reach of the world of the play is bounded by consecrated space, thereby imbuing the dramatic action with divine significance and moreover, a divine gaze. The play provides its audience with the opportunity to see the world as God would have it, or at least as the dramatist would have us believe that God wants us to see it. After all, as Mikhail Kobialka attests in his book, This Is My Body, the actions of the player, quote, imitate spiritual things, enacting a theater that does not merely reproduce the appearance of the subject, but allows a human being to perceive the universal soul, the intellect. It is also important to note here that the same network space that is a part of the uh, variation, the arrangement of these, of these seats of power, um, probably also mirrors the relationship of the, the space that Tegernsee shared with its sister monasteries around the Southern German speaking lands of this period, particularly the monastery at Benedict Moyern, where the famous Carmina Burana manuscript comes from. Um, there is evidence that one of the liturgies that's used in the play about the Antichrist might originate at Kloster Neuburg, which is right outside of, uh, of Vienna. Um, there is a roughly 70 line fragment of the play about the Antichrist that was um, created and, and survives from a monastery that's roughly about 70 miles south of Tegernsee in modern-day Austria at a monastery known as St. Georgenberg. And then lastly, 
this particular configuration of the church here and, and the, expect, the expectation that the altar would be in the east fits really well with the uh, church, the monastic church at Neustift, right outside of Brixen in northern Italy, also known as Bresinone. Um, there is still a little bit more work to be done there. I cannot say that with any certainty that maybe this play would have been conceived there, if not, if it, even if it wasn't written down there, um, but there is still yet much to be seen. Moving on to uh, contextual insights. So what can we get out of the, the way that these manuscripts are bound and how can that help inform the way that we stage things? Um, you'll, this is actually the text of the surviving text of the play about the Antichrist. Uh, you can see in the bottom left of that image, the, the manicure pointing to the capital letter T that begins the, the beginning of that um, uh, stage direction, Templum Domini there. So in looking at this particular manuscript, um, there are, we're going to turn back to the, you know, dramaturgy as this critical frame of analyzing this, this text and its materials, because essentially these, these sort of the manuscripts that were bound and those materials that were bound with the play serve as the buttressing materials for the drama that help us understand um, how it is supported. And if there is missing material within the play, perhaps we can find it in the, uh, the particular materials that were bound with it. Um, the manuscript that survives um, that I mentioned is now housed at the uh, Bavarian State Library in Munich, contains not only the Ludus Dante Cristo, but excerpts from the Gesta Friederiki and uh, Proverbia, and these kind of courtly you know, system, you know, the uh, understanding of the Holy Roman Imperial Court and its history and its connections to certain individuals. We also have rhetorical treatises uh, that were really important to the cloister school and would have been used within the monastic instruction, teaching students rhetoric, teaching students oration, proper comportment, both in terms of written material as well as uh, uh, performing oneself in court. And then lastly, we have the so-called letter, the Tegernsee letter collection and the Tegernsee love letters. So letter formulae, how do you write, how do you administer the work of a monastery? How do you connect with various authorities and figures of power that you would need to talk with? Um, and the, the poems and poetry that make it lovely and, and, and wonderful to experience the, uh, the skill and technology of writing. Um, there's one particularly reference, one reference in one of these letters that's very fascinating to me lately. Uh, it is to a game called Rhythmomachia, which you can see in the image on the right. Um, this was a game that was similar to chess in the way that it was laid out, but it was a numbers game uh, that was based upon Boethian arithmetic. So it was used within the quadrivium to be able to teach Boethian arithmetic, but it is also mimetically about laying out a martial uh, uh, means of interaction, of conquest and, and uh, superiority of numbers and how one can defeat uh, one's enemy with that superiority and how to kind of manage it and, and, and work within space. So again, just like the play is a text that captures this sense of con conceptualizing space for large groups of people who are moving largely to, in, in, to affect and interact and to win over other groups of people, so too do you have this in this game. So Tegernsey is certainly doing this uh, uh, throughout a lot of its particular phenomenon and gameplay that is going on. I think theater fits well within that. But I know what you're thinking. You're, you're, it, it always comes up when we're talking about early medieval Latin drama. What about the liturgy? Yes, this play does contain liturgies. Uh, but I do want to point out that plays like the Lutus Santi Cristo were just as likely to employ those liturgies for political ecclesiastical purposes, uh, propaganda purposes even, as they were to enhance the ceremonial, used to enhance the ceremonial and ritual aspects of liturgical performance. So there are four liturgies in this play. They roughly come from the Advent season, although uh, not completely. Uh, I'm happy to talk about any of these four liturgies in the question and answer session, but for the sake of brevity and time, I'm going to focus on the third in those bullet points there, the firmetur manus tua et exaltatur uh, dextera tua, strong is your hand and high is your right hand. That particular liturgy, its origins come from a uh, 10th century coronation uh, ordo uh, that was of English origins and certainly popular after the Norman conquest. Um, and we do have evidence that was uh, in manuscripts that it was exported in some ways to France. We're not sure how it got to Germany uh, or to Tegancy, but it shows up in this particular play. I wanna draw your attention though to it because there's some significant differences 
between the way that the Ludus Dante Cristo um, uh, performs this liturgy and the way that it survives and is described in the manuscripts that are capturing the coronation ordo. Um, the, the play uses a significant number of stage directions to really alter, or what I like to say, invert the actual liturgy, turn it kind of inside out. Let me show you what I mean through some, uh, the help of my, my wonderful students who uh, gave up part of their Saturday to do this for me. It is a bit um, uh, um, <laughs> low tech, if you want to call it that, but I think you'll get what I uh, am, am uh, trying to show you here. So this is the, we're going to start with two steps or two moments in the English coronation order. We have, of course, the entrance of the king first, uh, uh, indicated by the actor in red here. The king enters, uh, does a reverent gesture to the altar where the archbishop, in this case, standing on the left, on our left, and the Earl Marshal is standing on the right. They are both in front of the altar, but the king and his attendants enters first, and that is simply what happens next. We see the archbishop step, step forward and directs uh, towards the three sides of the church, a, uh, a call for public acclamations that, that the audience, the participants, the public accept this person as their king. It is then at that point, the choir sings the Firmetur Manus Tua. Moving ahead, now let's switch gears to the Ludus Dante Cristo. Uh, so the beginning of this particular scene where we are now entering into the, the point with the liturgy, rather than a figure of authority entering, in this case, it would be actually the Antichrist, um, we have the hypocrites. They are, again, a group of people coming in, and I can't apologize, it didn't have enough people to do this. We are just using one person to indicate a large group of people. Uh, the script indicates or says that, that the hypocrites enter and they move about the space, winning over the laity. What exactly that means, not quite sure, but the, nevertheless, they're the first group to enter. Then, it is only then that Antichrist enters, but doesn't process into the space fully, merely stops and then uh, uh, approaches uh, her and, or his um, uh, 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 retainers, in this case, the allegorical characters of hypocrisy and heresy. We will pause there and we will come back to this momentarily. Turn back again to the English coronation ordo um, after the king has processed into the space and we get uh, his reverent gesture towards the altar and the archbishop signaling to the various participants. The archbishop and the earl marshal turn. They turn out, they put on their vestments here indicated simply by some jackets. Uh, the king then also has his royal uh, robe of, uh, draped over him as well. And then as the ordo instructs, we are to bring in carpets and cushions and all kinds of lovely items to fill the space with for the next steps in this particular coronation. Um, again, relying on mats and, and jackets and things like that to signal to you uh, some aspects of this, um, this ordo and how it was done. Very good. And then right after that, we have the archbishop, uh, or pardon me, uh, the king approaches the altar, prostrates himself, gives a, lays a gift at the feet of the altar, stands, and the archbishop approaches the king to deliver the oath. And that is the, the, roughly the end of that particular part of the ordo before moving on to other things. But in the Ludus de Antichristo, as we mentioned earlier, Antichrist had not fully entered the space. He sends hypocrisy and heresy into the space. Hypocrisy then approaches the hypocrites who are standing in front of the king of Jerusalem and whispers into their ear. We don't know what, the play doesn't tell us what is whispered. It's simply that, that there is a whisper that is done between hypocrisy and the hypocrites. Hypocrites turn to face Antichrist. It is only at that point that Antichrist finally processes into the space, and then we are removing vestments rather than, or in this case, just outer uh, clothing, to reveal that Antichrist is wearing a breastplate and his retainers are wearing swords. And so we see the martial violent aims that they come with, and the Antichrist approaches the king of Jerusalem to depose him. And it is at that point the choir sings the Firmetur Manus. Tua. So we are taking a liturgy and we are completely uh, inverting it and using it for different purposes to indicate that the Antichrist is not a proper ruler. He is not properly ordained. He, the rituals by which we do ordain 
our rulers and give them the right or indicate to them the right to rule were, was done incorrectly. And therefore, this is a power that no one should be um, uh, listening to. Finally, turning to the methods for performing medieval drama, um, I would like to just kind of talk a little bit about this image for just a moment. Um, this is, we, we actually, this is from last week. Um, we just closed our, our production of the play Everybody by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins. It is a, a modern adaptation of the 15th century morality play Everyman. Um, and in it, I really enjoyed working with it because it gave me a lot of insight and kind of you know, confirmed for me the way that approaching medieval drama with um, modern theater tech, technique can really work, even if we are dealing with an adaptation. Because when we're talking about allegorical characters and we're talking about plays that have a strong moral message to deliver, and we are talking about a medieval world that is so far removed from our own, it is very difficult to find ways to help actors and performers ground their characters and ground the plot in something that they can feel is related to who they are and what they wish to communicate. So rather than thinking about um, theater or, or plays and drama as a means of storytelling, um, we have to think about it more as a means of composition, um, where the contributions of the voice, body, movement of actors, the costumes, the sets, the props, all of it, lighting, all of it's coming together uh, to, to contribute to a complete work of art. This is not pictorial art. This is art that is holistically um, a, a, about creating an experience, an affect on the part of an audience to drive them uh, towards particular feelings, emotions, and thoughts that are not always held within story, but, but sometimes simply held within the experience of coming into proximity and closeness, closeness with these materials um, such that everyone gets a bit of their own uh, take on it. And so there are two sources that I'm drawing from here, clearly not medieval sources, uh, but important nonetheless for the ways that we can really inform our practices when we stage medieval plays. Uh, the first is from Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright and, and director and theater theorist of the 20th century. Um, Brecht believed that theater should be a dialectic and that it needs to have this conversational aspect about it. I'll speak more to that in a moment. Um, he also believed in a theater that performs or reveals the theatrical facade. There is no fourth wall. Our audience should always remember that they are in a theater watching a play. I think that would have certainly been true for medieval audiences as well. Um, and then Brecht also met, gives emphasis to gestural performance. That gesture is actually more revealing of the actor's relationship with the character than trying to portray through naturalistic means a character that seems like you or I. And then I borrow a lot from the Polish theater director uh, and theorist Jerzy Gotowski, who believed that performance should be compositional, just as I was speaking about before, rather than merely or strictly mimetic. Um, he believed that there should be no spatial or aesthetic separation between the performer, the audience, and the performed, that, all, that what we are really dealing with here is proximities, how close one is to the work and how far away one might be. And then lastly, um, as you might imagine, this can certainly be very important for uh, a theater of the Middle Ages. Um, he believed in ritual as a performative scaffold rather than natural behavior. He, he, uh, he extrapolating that out, he, he called this theory a poor theater, not poor in terms of financial or economic means, but poor in terms of um, relating back to removing the, the kind of uh, naturalistic ways of acting, which for Grotowski were not naturalistic at all. They weren't even natural. But what is natural are rituals and routines. Those are key aspects of human interaction that we build within our society and within our culture, and therefore are far more um, uh, effective means of interaction and performing than trying to conceive of and capture some sense of naturalism. Um, to kind of hit upon this in, in, a, in a concise way uh, and keep this relatively short, um, I want to bring out the uh, character that we brought into our production of the play of Adam, a character called the reader. This is not a, well, I guess you could say they're not, they're not conceived of as a character in the original manuscript, but this person, this character was in the original manuscript as the stage directions, the didactic information that is uh, alongside the dialogue of the characters. We actually essentially turned the manuscript into a character in the play that we called the reader. And I was very, very lucky. Uh, had a unique opportunity, I think, when it comes to the relationship between graduate students and their 
uh, graduate advisors to be able to direct uh, Dr. Carol Symes in that role at the cloisters. And you can see her in various scenes here. But rather than seeing a fixed relationship between the manuscript and the performance, um, the, uh, the particular approach we employed sought to facilitate a space in which the text is in conversation with the performance. So the stage directions of the play become this participant voice, the reader. Um, so there's this very interesting point at the beginning of the play of the, and the, of the manuscript where the stage directions instruct how Adam and Eve are to portray their characters, that they should speak loudly and clearly, and that they should comport themselves with reverence and importance and so on and so forth. So because that was there, the reader at the beginning of the show was telling Adam and Eve and other actors how to play their parts. Uh, particularly Adam there at the very beginning. And um, when this happens, it, it creates this really lovely moment where Adam can accept the instruction, resist it, or look to others for a proper response uh, um, to that moment. But regardless of the choice that the actor makes, the reader is then forced to respond to the progression of the dramatic action as it's propelled forward by this interaction. So the reader embodies uh, some form of authorial gaze, but inhabits a liminal space between the performance and the audience. She sets, the she sets the expectations upon the performance for which the audience can then judge to be appropriate or inappropriate, thereby inviting the audience into a conversational dynamic with the performance. And these are just some of the fun scenes. I'll, I'll point your attention very quickly to the bottom left-hand scene. Um, this is a moment in the play where, where Cain is just about to kill Abel out of jealousy. And, and, and we kind of put a bit of a freeze frame on this and, and, and the stage directions and the reader explain how there's supposed to be a pot hidden in Abel's clothing so that when, when Cain goes to strike Abel, uh, uh, they actually strike the pot and break it or make some kind of sound that go along with it as Abel dies. Um, you, just reading this, you might think that it was a very serious, a very dramatic moment. It's not. This actually is a very funny moment. The pot doesn't make the sound of metal striking human flesh like you would expect. It makes a ding or a, you know, a break if it's a clay pot like what we had. And it doesn't at all sound human or natural. Um, and I think it's a bit of a moment, you know, the, the audience knows this story. They are, they are very familiar with it. They, there's no reason to believe that they, it needs to have an affect of, of gravitas, but it can be funny and it can be um, enjoyable because it's only in a few moments later that we really get the serious part where God lays, it, lays in to Cain, and then the lesson is made very, very clear. Um, when we're talking about acting and actors and how they should be looking at performing, particularly allegorical characters, this is a very difficult um, um, aspect of, with today's modern acting techniques that are grounded largely in psychological realism. Um, we need to create a theater where the becoming of character is the performative center of acting and of the performance rather than the being of character. This approach helps actors today navigate the challenges of playing allegorical characters. Much of the play about the Antichrist operates in the mode of what Mikhail Kobiaka identifies as allegoria in factis, representing contemporary events and individuals that are placed in conversation with, in this case, a well-established eschatology, so that the historical necessity of, again, in the case of uh, the Antichrist play, monasticism is not only symbolized, but demanded. The differentiation between character and actor, which is foundational to Brecht's estrangement effect, the theft from Dung's effect, bifurcates the mimesis of the actor's performance into that which seeks to represent the medieval and that which represents the transformative or transcendent. Thereby, thereby facilitating a discursive space and inviting the audience into it. As Brecht states, quote, the attitude the actor adopts is a socially critical one, such that performance becomes a discussion about social conditions with the audience. In this particular scene, in the image on the left, you have the character of Ecclesia, and on the right, pardon me, the character of Synagoga, and on the right, you have the character of Ecclesia up at the top of the stairs. Uh, synagoga is, is common of the representations of these two characters from this time period is seen masked, blinded. Uh, she cannot see the messianic promise that is Jesus, that is Christ. So um, it's fascinating because we just so happened that we cast a, a Jewish woman in this role. And you can see in the image on the right, she is lifting her mask and she is actually breaking character. And we devised moments within the performance where she could, would do this because 
the challenge of embodying a very anti-Semitic character is, was, was very personal to her and she felt it very deeply. And so we allowed space. Now we do not change the dialogue. We do not add anything into the text or the script. We simply provide these open moments for her to bring the mask up, release that and let go, let the body fall, let the, a sigh release from the breath, let the facial expressions change from, from big and expressive to, to challenged and hurt and, and potentially pained. And it's in those moments the audience is going, I can connect with that. That's, the per that's how I feel. I too feel a struggle with wanting to like this character. I don't like this character. It relieves me to know you don't as well. I empathize with the actor, not with the character. I go on the journey because the actor is asking me to go on the journey. And I want to know with, how the actor is going to experience this character over the course of the play. And that's how we kind of navigated the anti-Semitism that is embodied in this character of Sinagoga. Finally, the most important thing about staging medieval plays in any space is to have fun. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the rhythm of Machia, games are a part of the medieval world and certainly were a part of a lot of uh, medieval communities that, that, that were creating these plays. And they wanted to have fun as a part of them. Uh, this image here on the slide is from uh, when, as I mentioned before, we didn't have a big uh, cast and so we couldn't have armies of people on stage that were literally fighting. So when two world powers were competing against one another in battle, we portrayed it as a battle of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, and you can see that happening there. You see Synagoga or actually the actress playing Synagoga behind them, taking a picture of it, filming it for social media, which was actually a component of this performance as well. Um, but nonetheless, it, it was fun. It was enjoyable. It brought levity into this play uh, where there's so much um, uh, difficult material that is not only tied to eschatology, but it's school material meant to teach things like, like rhetoric and oration and those sorts of things. And these were lovely little fun moments to have a good time, uh, both on stage and with our audiences. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention tonight and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Kyle. What a incredible um, talk. Whew. <laughs> so much, um, so much material and so fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, please, if you have questions, go ahead and um, chew on them maybe for a second, pop them into the Q&A. Um, since there's nobody right in there right away, I just want to say, um, as someone who studies architecture in the Middle Ages, um, just your conception of space has really kind of changed the way a little bit I think of those spaces as potential performative spaces. Um, and, um, you know, you talked about them in the sense of the four cardinal points, northwest, east, south, and a little bit about how perhaps it should or shouldn't be directed towards the altar itself. Um, when those were taken out of a ecclesiastical architectural space, um, I guess, did they still adhere? Did I, did I understand that right? Were they trying to adhere to those cardinal um, directions or was it really just uh, something looser in the way that they mapped things out? I think it could be possible that they are. I think that maybe why the, the play, be, particularly the play about the Antichrist, begins with that um, particular layout is that, so that it can work in, in various other spaces. If this is not performed in a, in a church that is laid out along an east-west axis with, axis with the uh, altar in the east, um, uh, perhaps whatever the arrangement of the space is for whatever use that the play is being um, uh, put into in that case, um, could be laid out at, in the, in, along those cardinal directions if they were known. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard to, to be able to, it's hard to kind of um, unpack in many ways. There are other plays that really indicate um, uh, either an ecclesiastical um, uh, uh, spatial use, for example, play about the play of Adam, actually the, the, the opening stage directions are, are pretty, a pretty strong indicator that that the pl play was intended or at least imagined and conceived to have per been performed in front of a church uh, with a set of, of stairs that provide different layers. There's a, 
description of God being kind of above Adam and Eve in some way, or, or behind, maybe behind them and above them. Uh, there's, a, there's a discussion about a, 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 a piece of fabric or material that could be strung about to hide Adam and Eve's nakedness so that they're actually kind of behind a uh, some type of, of screen or material that could be stretched out and then taken away when, when the Garden of Eden is, is closed off to them. Um, so there's certainly some indication, and, and, and there are other, many, many other plays where uh, there's a good sense that, that it would have been uh, conceived for, at least thought about uh, uh, being performed in a church. But I, I like that, that this play provides the cardinal directions more so because it actually tell, takes us out of the church. It, it's not necessarily saying this has to be uh, something that we perform within a church. And, and unfortunately, there are too many histories uh, that do talk about, and I'm thinking of E.K. Chambers, who begins his discussion with this play saying, it must have been performed in some grand nave of a church. And there, there's no indication that it was. Uh, and if it, if it was Tegernsey, it's certain, the church there is certainly not laid out in a way that would fit with these particular directions. I love that. I love the, you know, continually challenging us to think of the fluidity. We think, you know, a lot of people do think thinking of the Middle Ages is so laden with all of the re religiosity, but um, I'm looking at the outside of cathedrals and thinking about that as as performative spaces, yes. um, but not necessarily in a in a specifically religious way. But let's get to some of these other questions. Looks like lots of people have some ideas. Um, uh, Dr. Tim Graham has asked, what other medieval plays would you most like to produce and why? Are there particular spaces beyond the cloisters and the Newbury Library you would love to be able to use in your productions of medieval plays? Oh, that's such a great question. Uh, there's so, there are many plays. Um, the ones that kind of come to mind right off the top of my head uh, are, are, I would really love to do the Filius Getronis, the son of Getron, uh, which is a part of the, the, the Fleury playbook and, and this kind of St. Nicholas plays. There's so many St. Nicholas plays. It would actually really be fun to put together a, a theater festival that really actually focuses on just St. Nicholas. And, and, and the many plays that are, are conceived of either about him or kind of in uh, about his, his, his hagiography and dramatizing that um, or is in some way kind of involving him of some kind. Um, I think that particular play is so, so different from, from so many other medieval plays it would really be fascinating to work with. Um, I've, I've, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I did have the joy of staging Bobbio, a, a 12th century Latin comedy um, at, at the Newbury Library, but also at the Spurlock Museum on the campus of, of the University of Illinois. And I would love to return to that play, um, it, particularly for uh, theater students, because it is just so funny. It's just, it, it's constant humor, movement, um, ridiculousness. Uh, you have a terrible lecherous priest. You have his witty servant, who is based on a lot of Roman servant type characters from, from uh, um, uh, Roman comedy like Terence and Plautus. Um, you have a castration scene, you have all these other kind of crazy things happening. Um, so it would be a lot of fun to, to do. And I think it would really kind of change a lot of those, those um, misconceptions about me what medieval drama is and, and what it can be. Um, but also just to kind of book in, I'll say that I, I, I've really been, um, as of late, diving into the plays of Hrothsvit. Uh, and and I, think that, I think that there is a lot of material there that um, while dense and difficult, um, if we can provide some really quality performance translations of her work, I think we would see that her plays are actually brilliantly uh, conceived of. Her dramaturgy is just very tight and very well constructed and uh, would make for excellent productions, um, particularly as a way of, of, of promoting the first named known European play, a female playwright. I, that, that is, uh, I think one of the most important things that we could do. So yeah, that, that, those would be some of the plays that I would love to do. Where, as to where to do them, I really love found spaces and, and non-traditional spaces. So throw anything at me and I wanna work with it. Um, I love doing outdoor performance. I love working in the museums that I've worked in, which there's so much to gesture to in those museums and those spaces. So that would be a lot of fun, not to mention a church or even a, you know, a surviving monastery uh, over in Europe or even here in the United States would be a lot of fun to work in as well. Um, next question is from Kathy Wimmer. I'm not an academic, but I am a longtime theater person and fell in love with medieval theater during my BFA time at UNM about 40 years ago. 
How much do you think medieval performers interacted with the audience, actually drawing them in to take part in the drama? Great question, Kathy. That is a really good question. Um, you know, it's hard to say. I think I think there are certainly plays where uh, uh, you know you, you think of you think of the um, the mystery plays of the of the York cycle or Chester cycle of of late medieval England, um, and certainly those plays would have been, uh, I, I, as, as to how much they may have pulled people into the, the performance, I don't know, but certainly there was this acknowledgement of the audience, there was interaction with the audience, there was an expectation of laughs in certain moments, maybe groans in other moments and those sorts of things. Um, but when you're dealing with the, you know, as I do with, with the more earlier uh, Latin medieval drama, um, you know, I think these liturgies are actually moments where, like, we all know the liturgy, right? Like, we all know that we sing this part at this point, and, and, and that's how, you know, we have this moment, this antiphonary, maybe, where we call and respond a little bit back and forth. Um, and, and there's certainly a signal to the audience that they know this. Like, hey, you know this. It's like, if we all just, I said, hey, let's all sing happy birthday, and then took a breath and we, let's go, you'd all know how to sing, you'd know the tune, you'd know where to go, you'd probably even do some little harmonies that we all like to do when we sing that song. There's kind of that gesture, that wink wink that's being done in these moments to say, hey, we're either saying this is the way we like it or this is the way we enjoy this liturgy or this is how we understand this liturgical moment um, or they're altering it like what we see in the uh, play about the Antichrist so that it, um, it, it, you can clearly recognize, oh gosh, that's not how we do that. Why are we doing it this way? This is very, this is meant to be something different. Um, and then, you know, you've got moments like where the hypocrites are supposed to go and win, win over the laity. What that means, we don't know. I, I've posited that it could potentially um, gesture back to the, um, the sign symbols of, of monasteries that, like uh, the Kumiaks um, with their, um, their system that they have in place so that they don't actually speak to one another they maintain their vow of silence. I think that there's some degree these, these hypocrites are coming in and acting like those kinds of, of monastic communities saying, oh, you know, we're in here and that kind of thing to give them the sense of we're not from here. We're the other guys and, and we're, meant to be, we're meant to be seen as the other in this case and in case and likely a uh, um, uh, part of the bad guys of retinue. So um, I think that medieval drama is, to put a kind of a button answer on your question, I think medieval drama always has within it uh, a place for the audience to interact very, very closely with the performance, much more closely than what we're used to in most of our modern theater. Um, whether it always does or not is kind of hard to tell in some extant scripts, but I, I like to think that, that given the performance conventions of the day and, and, and what we know of them, that it's almost certainly that, that, that there was an expectation that the, the, the audience would be very close to the dramatic action in some way. Right, um, I'm just gonna, I'm scrolling through and I see that Dr. Chandler had pretty much the same question. So um, Dr. Chandler, I think the audience reaction and interaction was just kind of covered there, but thank you for your question. Um, Carol Joyner is asking, and this is true of any outdoor performance, I think, without a backstage, how did the actors manage costume changes and things that modern audiences don't normally see? That's great. That's a great question. Uh, one, I, I, you know, it depends on if there are costume changes. Clearly in uh, Antichrist, we do have these moments where there's a description of, of, of costumes being taken off or put on or something. Um, in a uh, play of Adam, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do in having such a small cast was actually make sure, like, you know, could test the fact that we could perform this play with only five actors, and we can. Um, of course, it requires uh, costume changes. To what degree costumes would have been relied on to signal aspects of character or story or other things like that? Sometimes it's hard to tell within an extant script, um, so I, I can't speak so much to what staging practices would have been like, except to say this. Um, in the Brechtian uh, 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 theory of theater and conception of it, um, we are dealing where, with a theater where the theatricality is always on display. Um, I, I love to direct shows and put costume changes in my shows. Um, I directed an opera a few years ago where we had an actress, um, a singer, actually go from a relatively kind of modern dress to a beautiful, big um, uh, 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 18th century gown that she had to put on on stage, corseted and all. 
and, and we showed that actual costume transition. It becomes a part of the drama, becomes a part of the play. And so again, it's, it's a, that aspect of becoming character that is, I think, a big part of uh, medieval drama that we kind of miss from time to time. So if we are seeing characters undress or dress or you know, actors robe or disrobe in some various ways to change costume, we probably would see it. Even if, it, even if it's not in the midst of the gaze of the action of the play, it's probably almost certainly on the margins. Um, if you think about the pageant wagons of medieval, late medieval England, um, you can't hide too much. There, I mean, there is a bit of a backstage area, but people can still walk around, walk by and move about this, uh, some, particularly the more open air spaces um, so that they could see those things happening. Um, I don't think that there would have been any attempt to hide it. I think it would have been more about bringing it into uh, the play as a means of understanding it as, as the transformation of that actor from character to uh, various other characters. And can I also add, I think, outside of our understanding of characters changing clothes, and we think of clothes as such a identifier, but it could also be props, could it not? That somebody yes. just grabs something and when they're holding this, then they are, you know, presenting themselves in a different way. So I think that's wonderful. Yes. I love the outdoor theater and I love the creativity of how people do that. Exactly. Yeah. It's part of the part of the the jest. Um, it's a bigger challenge, but it, but when it pays off, it really it really resonates well. I think yes. Indeed, um, Dr. Laura Weigert is asking, what are some of your favorite performances of medieval drama that you've seen and learned from, or alternatively, ones that, in your opinion, have gotten it wrong? <laughs> Um, I, I may get in trouble if I talk too much about the second aspect of that of that uh, question. Um, I, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't seen a lot of medieval dramas. Uh, I, I, I know the the Ludus Danielis, the play of Daniel that was done at the Cloisters uh, many many years ago and was recorded. Um, I have seen that, and I think it's it's quite lovely um, uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, the music in it is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, the staging is fascinating, I, I, but I, you know, if I, I'll stick with that one for a minute because it's many, many decades removed from, from when that, I think that famous performance was done uh, um, a while back. Um, again, I think what you see in performances like that are these kind of like high degree, like high acting style, very big and stylistic um, uh, performances, particularly the way that the characters are dressed, it just strikes me as being so Bible performance, you know, so church performance. And I, and I, and I don't mean, I really don't mean that in a, in a terrible way, but for theater, it seems to signal to me the way that we did, you know, performances when I was growing up in church where you, you put on some robes and you tie a rope around your waist and you, you find a nice old crown that's kind of sparkly a little bit with some jewels in it and that's a king. Uh, and then you give somebody a, st a staff with a crook in it and they're a shepherd and the priest may have a crozier or something like that. But, you know, it's roughly the same kind of look. Um, you know, we, we have some of that in the, the play of Adam that we have there and the costume designer did a fantastic job. But one of the things that I talked to uh, her about in, in conceptualizing the costumes for that production was, I don't want this to be the kind of traditional sense of religious drama, religious plays that we may have from most, a lot of us as Americans have from our upbringing. Um, uh, we want this to be, to be um, beautiful, but we want it to be colorful. We want the, um, we want the costumes to signal uh, uh, not only a sense of who the character is, but maybe their importance or their uh, lack of importance. Um, in, in one case, um, in, the, in the end of the play, uh, or close to the end of the play, there's a, there's a moment in the Ordo Profitarum, the liturgical um, service of the prophets that happens in the kind of third act of play of Adam. Uh, there's a character that's simply just called the Jew. Uh, and you can imagine that this is you know, a very uh, a, a troublesome, problematic character for obvious reasons. Um, and, and we changed the character designation from being um, a Jewish person to being a student. And so we had um, a young kind of uh, a scholastic looking um, actor in, in kind of similar, relatively modern wear, this kind of blue cape, a Parisian kind of student, blue cape and uh, a red beret and, and ready to, answer, to ask and answer questions to uh, the prophets as, as she encountered them, particularly Elijah. Um, but yeah, uh, I, that, as far as medieval performances that I've seen, um, 
I'm really actually racking my brain to see. <laughs> I can't think of a whole lot of medieval plays that I've seen. Um, the University of South Dakota did an adaptation of some of the York Cycle plays um, recently that was done over Zoom. It was really a lot of fun uh, and, and, and very enjoyable and, cert and really kind of brought out the more um, uh, gothic nature of the characters of, of the, surrounding the devil and his minions and demons and things like that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I've seen some Zoom recordings from um, uh, the uh, group and uh, at the University of York in Toronto uh, who do great work as well. And, and a lot of them, you know, really are kind of throwing together what they can with the resources that they have. And, and at, the, at every performance, the thing I love the most is just how much fun they have doing it. And it's clearly meant to be a source of bringing us in into that fun and, and enjoying medieval drama on maybe a different um, set of, of, of means of engagement. I fell into the trap of being <laughs> muted and talking. Um, I'm going to go to a question from Remy Senegal because it touches on something I think you were just mentioning. Um, I don't know much at all about medieval theater, but there is there any play you would not do because of themes of racism or anti-Semitism that are too strong or aggressive? Do you simply change those elements or just not do the play? What a great question. That is a good question. Um, hmm. I think this is this is a question. I think that it isn't even specific to medieval drama. I think this is a question that we can ask of just about any historical period uh, in theater history. Um, I think ultimately, I do not believe that that any play belongs um, uh, put away in a vault in the sense that that it's never read. I think that there there as historical materials as historical artifacts. Um, uh, regardless of, of kind of how they treat certain characters, certain themes, um, certain ideas, uh, there is some his value to history in studying those materials and, and in using the expertise of, say, a teacher, instructor, um, or a scholar to be able to help us um, uh, uh, conceptualize those materials historically and what their place was then and how we uh, uh, might understand them today. Uh, but I do believe that there are some plays that, that should not be performed anymore. Um, and I, I think that's true throughout theater history period. Uh, that is not just uh, specific to the Middle Ages. As to any play that I can think of off the top of my head, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank at the moment. Um, but but unless, unless you feel, as, a, as someone who might be looking to stage a medieval play, unless you feel that you have some methods and ability to um, uh, uh, frame those characters or, the, or those scenes or those dialogues uh, in ways that kind of help us remove ourselves as both an audience but as performers from what the, the historical meanings were and, uh, uh, and, and historical significations were in those moments, then it's probably best to either eliminate them, not do the performance at all, or wholly change it kind of like what we did for Play of Adam. Um, in that case, it was just, a, there was a lot else, there were a lot of other things I was trying to focus on in that performance that, uh, that I, that I, that I um, uh, wasn't able to do the same way as I did for Play of Adam, or excuse me, for Play of Antichrist. So uh, it was just easier to change that particular character so that we could keep the text, we didn't have to change the, the, the situation was that, you know, it's this learned individual who is asking these questions of uh, the character of Elijah based upon uh, the kind of fashionable theology that was coming out of mainly Parisian uh, cathedral schools and, and, and some monastic schools in those areas uh, based upon Aristotelian thinking that was kind of influencing the theology of the day. So it was certainly a, a, an important moment and one that kind of um, provided this great opportunity for dialogue and really brought out the dialect, dialectical nature of, of the performance. So I didn't want to lose it but um, it was a lot better to, to move that character from being a, a clearly a Jewish individual to uh, someone who was just a student and, and, and kind of showing off how much they knew, uh, excited about being, having learned these new things, yeah. I have a question from Stephen Bishop. Um, 
And let me just say before I, I ask his question, it is at the seven o'clock hour here, so a little later for you. Um, do, are you okay with continuing? We have a yes, a, yes, a little, please. This is great. Less than having a, a fantastic, fantastic time. Great. I love our audience. They always have wonderful questions. So, um, Dr. Stephen Bishop asks, are the performances at U of I open air rather than at Cranert for staging aesthetic reasons or COVID nineteen reasons? If the former, what are they? If the latter, do you feel the outside space nonetheless offered productive possibilities? So at the, the the one we staged at the University of Illinois was, well, technically we actually brought the play of Adam back to the University of Illinois as well. If, if you're familiar at all, there is a video on YouTube. Uh, I think if you just Google or, Google or search um, uh, play of Adam, uh, you'll get our actual uh, video of it. That actual video doesn't come from the cloisters. It comes from a, a church that we, uh, St. John the Divine Episcopal Church, uh, there in, on the campus of the University of Illinois that we were able to use. And that was back in 2016-17 uh, when we did that. Um, the other performance, the play about the Antichrist, was done outdoors um, because, uh, actually because the Cranner Center was full. Um, there, were, there was no uh, other performance space for us to use. Uh, it was a collaboration. Um, between the Medieval Studies Program at the University of Illinois and the Department of Theater at the University of Illinois, um, but it, it was best seen to happen outdoors. Also, um, I wanted to give our audience a chance to kind of organize themselves around the space. I didn't want to dictate to the audience where they needed to stand or where they needed to be at any moment in the, in the production. Uh, so the outdoor space allowed much uh, for that much more. Um, I also wanted to test out the way in which medieval theater, um, and I think this is why it's so great for, for uh, young uh, theater artists today to work on, is that it actually has to grab your attention. Most medieval plays work to, to, to snatch your attention away from something else um, so that you are looking at us and not at the things going on over there. And it just so happens that, that during the performance of, of, of one of the performances of play about the Antichrist, uh, there was some kind of like science fair or something going on. And so people were like shooting off rockets and, and doing all kinds of other fun things that looked really, really enjoyable uh, uh, and, and very easily um, could, could take the, the gaze of the audience away towards those things, uh, which were a little ways off, but not too far. Um, so it was, it was really nice for these actors to have to work to, to really make sure that they capture the attention of the audience. I think uh, one of my big critiques of, of theater and the way that it's done today and what I teach in my acting classes is that you, your performance is a, a not, not an invitation to watch, but a demand that you watch. It is something to say, I have worked, I have done hard, and this is going to be amazing and you need to watch it. Um, too often uh, nowadays, I believe theater artists ex just come, you know, expect the audiences to be quiet, to sit reverently and to watch what is happening on stage. Uh, and the actors don't have to work as hard well, when that is the case. And so um, I, I, I believe in pushing the actors to demand the attention of their audience, not just to expect it. So that's, that's, that kind of underlies, and plus, I mean, also moving around the space and those sorts of things, as I talked about, were a big part of what we were trying to uh, play with in that production. And so it proved a better uh, space. But um, in, in the Everybody production that, we, that I did close last week, we did put that outside because of COVID-19 uh, issues. Um, it was originally conceived to be an indoor performance, um, but because it's the last performance of our season here at Missouri State University, uh, we were able to plan enough ahead of time to be able to reserve an outdoor space and, and make some changes in our design process so that we could facilitate that to work for the performance. Um, so that would, yes, it was, it was strictly because of COVID-19. That's why we moved outdoors. But I'm really glad that we did because I think that it made the, the show even, it enhanced it immensely in ways that I never expected. What a, what a fascinating perspective, that notion of demanding the performance. I love that. And the idea that you're competing with a science fair <laughs> it's just great because the whole idea, right, of early, earlier medieval plays being within a festival, maybe atmosphere, yes. or at least within a city scape in which who knows what other things are happening. I think yeah, I took, I, I took a little to bit from Sarah, Sarah Beckwith's uh, Signifying God, her book, where she talks about that. And Carol Symes' book, A Common Stage, talks about, you know, we're out in this, con this, this common space, this, this town square where people are hustling and bustling and things are happening. 
that that all can, is basically a part of the performance. And so you've got to either incorporate it or you've got to figure out how to uh, uh, bring your audience away from it in some way. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it just makes it more fun. Definitely, definitely. Okay, let's see. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, Dr. Michael Ryan asks and says, I thoroughly love this presentation and thank you for sharing your expertise. Much of what struck me about that play is the inherent drama of the apocalypse mm. that surrounded it and was key to the stage directions, use of space and evo evocation of large numbers as also mirrored in the numbers game. How did Revelations 19.5 liturgy, you mentioned, Laudum Dicti, am I reading this right? Dicte mm -hmm. Deo Nostro also contribute to the sense of apocalyptic drama if it did? The, oh, good question. Um, it, of, of the four liturgies in the play, that one is the smallest, and and it and it's it's mentioned near the end. Um, it is a moment where um, ecclesia is kind of bringing everyone together. It's one of the. It may even be the very very last uh, uh, set of lines that are captured in the manuscript. I, I'm not 100 certain off the top of my head, but it is at the very end, and it's after Antichrist has been uh, has been has been killed or died or whatever it is that kills him. Um, some divine um, sound or thunder strike or something. Um, it, it there's this. It's an All Saints liturgy. So that was that liturgy is specific to uh, the Feast of All Saints. Um, it is the only liturgy that isn't squarely within kind of the Christmas season. Uh, the rest of the other three liturgies are have they are, are really kind of uh, centered around either Advent or Christmas. Um, and and so this one's certainly kind of earlier in the liturgical calendar. But I believe that it's meant to be this moment where, you know, it's the ecclesia, the, the figure of the church who is, is at the very end, uh, you know, bringing all of the saints together into her, um, uh, not only her gaze, but also as kind of in this space as well and bringing um, uh, the, the, the audience as well as the performers into that idea as being a part of the sainthood. Um, I should also mention too that no, this is this is a monastic play. This is this is not a um, a play that would have been done by uh, bishops or, or other other uh, ecclesiastical clerics. These were um, you know min monastic figures. So so it's it's a pretty pretty um, significant statement for the the church to be embodied by a monk and not um, uh, other figures, other uh, authoritarian figures of 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 kind of the church hierarchy at that time. Um, so you've got this moment at the end, it's, you know, the Antichrist is dead, lays dead. A monk who is portraying the character of the church, Ecclesia, is now singing the All Saints liturgy, you know, basically bringing us all into this conceptualization of a, of a saintly space that we occupy and, and bringing us kind of into that sense of connection with God through the church, but really through monasticism more than anything. Wow, what an interesting way to think of that con contextual aspect that you were talking about, <clears throat> and that it really shifts things from maybe the natural, normal way people think in theater, allowing people to invert and, and think of things in different ways. That's really, yeah. really fantastic. Um, I think you touched a little bit upon this, but um, Timothy Peterson is asking, um, or he says, assume these two plays were popular in their day, and does either survive in fragmentary form in other medieval manuscripts, or are they referenced in other medieval manuscripts? So kind of what's the spread here of these um, texts? I believe the play of Adam has another fragment. I, I'm not completely certain. The, the surviving manuscript I know comes from Tours, um, uh, uh, and, and is, is very, it's either really early uh, 13th century or very late 12th century. Uh, might be like right on the line. Um, and then, uh, so I think there might be another fragment of it. Um, if, if, if that's the case, it, it gives us no more information than the main surviving fragment from the library at Tour. Um, the other, uh, the play about the Antichrist, um, it's complete manuscript. It survives at the uh, Bavarian State Library, as I mentioned. Um, I, I also kind of I talked a little bit briefly about this, um, um, so there's a there's a, a, um, a gospel manuscript, a gospel codex uh, that it comes from the St. Georgenberg Monastery at Fichte. And on one of the um, verso sides of one of the folios is um, roughly about 70 lines of the beginning of this play, of the play about the Antichrist. 
Um, I don't know why it's fragmentary. I don't, we don't know why the, the scribe didn't continue because it really only takes up about a quarter of the, of the, the whole page. It's, it's quite small compared to the actual uh, manuscript uh, page itself. Um, it, it is interesting to note that that, that fragment was, uh, survives within a, um, a gospel manuscript, whereas the, the, the play from Tegancy survives within this, this um, uh, school book, essentially. Uh, a, a book that would have been used for, for educational purposes. Um, so two very different contexts for this play. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to think that that, that that certainly not only indicates the uh, use of it within the cloister school at Tegernsey, but that probably St. Georgenberg didn't really have much of a school going on. We do know they had a relationship between these two monasteries. There are letters and some other indications that they were in communication with one another. But why, it got, why and how it, it got to St. Georgenberg, we don't know. And what it's used, what it would have been used for, we don't know either. Um, I'm sorry. What was the second aspect of that uh, that that question? Um, oh, I, there's other references to them. Um, there is. There's long been, uh, uh, and thanks to um, uh, Lawrence Clopper and and Max Harris, uh, there was long a, um, a belief that Gerhard of Reichersberg um, from um, uh, at the Augsburg uh, uh, Cathedral chapter that was there. Um, that he writes about these these antichrist these they're this apocalyptic plays or these performances he calls them ludi and spectacula so we're kind of combining two different terms um, but he talks about you know them being apocalyptic in nature and that there's a you know antichrist figure but there's a Herod figure and things like that um, for a long time people thought that Gerhard was actually talking about the play about the antichrist uh, simply because he mentions antichrist as a figure in those games and those playful things that they were doing playful performances. Um, but Max Harris and, and Lawrence Clopper both uh, pointed to evidence that that's not the case. I also believe that that is not the case. Um, but, but certainly um, there were antichrist performances that were gameful in some way or silly or a part of the, um, the schools and the choir boys and things that, that were being performed uh, in these sacred spaces that for some people like Gerhard or uh, Herod of Landersberg um, the, they, they did not like this. They thought that it was a really bad thing. We shouldn't be doing this. We're inviting, we're inviting evilness into our, our sacred spaces. We're inviting the devil into our sacred spaces, so on and so forth. Um, so, so antichrist performances were not unusual for that part of, of uh, Europe uh, in that part of, in that time period. Um, but as to whether they were performing the play about the antichrist, I don't think that was the case in Augsburg. Uh, but, but it, it, again, speaking about this kind of larger network that Tegancy was a part of, it certainly is possible that there was a tradition or a, a, a culture in which um, uh, there were these kinds of plays and performances, and some of them just happened to get written, written down. And for what reason, we can't be sure either, but, um, you know, they're trying to kind of maybe fix some aspects of the way that that community performs it and how that community understands the performance to be important important for what they're trying to do. Okay, um, we had a follow up from the discussion about um, how you cope with um, older texts that have racism and antisemitism. And Carol Joyner was asking, would another alternative be to perform the play with a disclaimer or commentary? Is that something you've ever done or would think? Um, uh, uh, I have not done that for any of the medieval plays. Um, oftentimes in theater, we, we, we do provide disclaimers, kind of, kind of content warnings for our audiences, whether it be uh, like guns going off or, or, or nudity or some state of undress within the play or really strong language, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's helpful. I think that that's certainly a way of, of looking at it. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of a, a recent musical that was on Broadway um, called Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. And in it, there's the discussion of Andrew Jackson's removal of uh, the Native American Indians um, from their, their ancestral tribal lands to the, um, uh, the, the reservations and such further out west. Um, and, and they're supposed to be actors playing Indians in those scenes. And, and it's usually white actors playing indigenous characters uh, or representations of indigenous peoples. And um, I don't think a disclaimer goes far enough, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, it, and that's generally because performance speaks so much louder in the moment than remembering that, oh, there was a disclaimer I read maybe outside of the theater or in my playbill 
that's telling me that this is going to happen, even if it's a really well written one and one that, that really conceptualizes uh, uh, why it's important to continue to perform this and, and what it was doing historically and what we can do with it today and those sorts of things. Um, I think that if it's the kind of scene you can perform where you can really engage the dialectical nature of performance after that scene or during that scene, then maybe there's a way to navigate it. Um, but you do, there certainly has to be not only a, a literary or, or textual signal that this is something that is difficult and challenging and we, we don't you know, condone, um, but there also has to be a performative signal as well. I think to couple with that, there has to be something in performance that is signaling just as loud as the performance itself. This is not uh, uh, okay. That this is we don't we don't condone this representation, but this representation uh, uh, is important for these reasons, and, and 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 even open the audience to some to to give their feedback, to give their displeasure, to give their dislike of that of that performance. I, again, I think our I think our theater today is largely built on conventions that keep the audience away from the performance because that's dangerous feeling. So you know, oh, what if they don't like it? What if they don't like us? What if they boo us? What if they Nobody throws tomatoes anymore, but what if we did uh, throw rotten fruit on stage? Um, but I think that that actually, you know, if you were to give your, an audience a, a boo card or a, a something that they could toss onto the stage to indicate their dislike, dissatisfaction, and displeasure at what you're doing, then maybe, because you're giving the audience some agency, some ability to say, um, this isn't, this, we don't like this. This is not, this is not okay. And that even despite the, attempt to frame this in a way that might make it, you know, more about its history than about the current moment, um, the audience can still kind of weigh in there and, and, and they at least walk away saying, well, at least we got to tell them we didn't like it and they can take it and stuff it. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I, I would say disclaimers aren't enough. Um, there's got to be something in the performance that, that does something to signal that, that same kind of sense of what a disclaimer is doing. That really goes well to your point about the experiential nature of medieval theater and maybe what should be in some um, contemporary theater, right? And, and the idea that we go into contemporary theater with a lot of expectations, both on the side, on the stage, expecting an audience, in fact, to love it. Like, yes. right? I mean, is there is there a performance I've been to in the many, many years that hasn't gotten a standing ovation? No, right? So, so that kind of thing, I think it's a really good good answer to a to a complex question. So the last um, couple of things we have are, are kind of comments. Um, so Edward Weil um, says that he thinks the Castle of Perseverance would be a good one to perform if you haven't. I don't know if you... Um... Yes, yeah, I would love to do that one. Um, and and it's particularly because it comes with this manuscript that has this beautiful this, uh, um, uh, image of, of, of the what the performance kind might look like. Um, I, I believe the, the group at, at, at Toronto um, performed it back in, I want to say the 1980s, um, and there's some images of it that still exist and have been circulated in some, some uh, textbooks uh, where they built that central structure and they kind of had, you know, the audience around it in the circle as it comes from that manuscript. Um, but it's still hard to interpret what that, what that image is telling us. What, you know, what is this really supposed to look like? Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Weigert's uh, talk yesterday about the, the, this, the image of the, the martyrdom of St. Apollonia, and you've got that kind of rounded structure in the background of that image, and, and, I, and I have to apologize because I've used that image probably a few too many times in talking about medieval theater uh, for my students, and I appreciate that talk because now I'm going to talk about it a little differently. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I certainly think that... Um, uh, one, that would be just a brilliant play to, to work on. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a great work of medieval drama. Um, and, 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 that, and playing and figuring out how that, that particular image might be conceived of in performance and, and, and you know, understanding an audience that is sitting all around you in this theater in the round type setup is, is again, um, really valuable for actors to learn how to use and to kind of to consider this, to consider the, the playing space literally as playing space. It is a playground. Um, as a director, I'll often talk to my scenic designers in the early stages of, of a process of, of any production, no matter what it is, and I will tell them, give me a playground. I want to play. I want my actors to play. Um, if they don't have things to climb up and crawl under and, 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 and things to get dirty on and, and jump off of and that kind of stuff, then, then what kind of performance are we doing here? Uh, and I certainly think that was, um, 
I think that was a lot of what was in the mind of medieval dramatists was that uh, theater is a is a, is a, an opportunity to play, and and I think in many ways that's also why theater was was very regulated and, and performance was very regulated by certain authorities, or at least attempted. There was an attempt to regulate it uh, quite a bit, as as Dr. Carol Symes says very often. Um, if if they weren't doing it, why why were there attempts to regulate it? Well, they were doing it because it was fun and there was play at the heart of it. And so uh, whatever we do with the castle of Perseverance, whether it be we try to stage it as honestly to the way the manuscript captures it as possible or not, ultimately what we're doing is we're creating a playground space. And I would like to really look at it as a playground space that's not just a playground for the actors, but also a playground for the audience and see how that interaction changes the, di the, the dramatic dynamics of the uh, surviving script itself. But yes, that's a great example. I, thank you for bringing it up. I would love to do that one. I love that reminder that plays are playful. I think that's really fascinating. Yes. Um, so the last question comment comes from Kathy Wimmer again. Um, she's talking about England's National Theater did the mysteries in 1985 that she says is amazing and, and they may have staged it later. She's asking, have you ever staged the second Shepherd's play it was included in that? No, I haven't. I actually have. And, and tr truth be told, I haven't done a lot of the late medieval. I've really done none of the late medieval English plays. Um, the closest I get is is Everyman. I, I was I acted in it many, many years ago and then obviously directing this adaptation of it uh, very recently. But um, uh, that doesn't fit within the mystery plays. It's just a, a standalone morality play. But um, and, and not a very good one, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, Second Shepherds is a blast. Um, when I'm able to teach it for uh, script analysis or um, uh, some other uh, 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 classes where we're talking about medieval uh, scripts and plays, um, that's, that's definitely one that, that I love to give the uh, students an opportunity to kind of enact scenes from, particularly all the scenes with the, 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 the lamb. I mean, goodness gracious, that is just hilarious stuff. You know, it really is the roots of English comedy, if you ask me. Um, that kind of like, oh yeah, this is no, this isn't a lamb. This is a person. This is a baby. Of course, it's a baby. It just cries really weird. Um, so yeah, I, I, it would be a lot of fun to be able to direct that. There's a great recording of it on YouTube um, that was done a few years. I think it's on YouTube, but it's on a streaming service somewhere that I've seen. Um, that's pretty fun. It's done kind of out in the woods and, and out amongst the English countryside. Um, and and actually, your your question actually or your comment brought back to me. Um, going back to the question about whether I, you know, what medieval plays have I seen that have really inspired me, um, about, uh, I want to say it was 2012 or 2013, um, you know, the city of York uh, regularly does its, its mystery plays outside of the, um, <clears throat> the, the ruins of the cathedral there, and um, there was a particular production of it that just is, I didn't see the whole thing, um, but there are clips of it online on YouTube, as well as a trailer of it online. And I think it's from 2012. It could be off by a year there. Um, but I highly recommend seeing it because it certainly has influenced the way that I uh, look at medieval plays. And you know, the, in particular, in that performance, you see this mix of um, kind of the medieval aspects of costume, but they're, um, they're characters that are uh, like monochromatic. So they're all like in purple or they're all in yellow. They're these bright, beautiful colors, but they're individual actors, individual characters. And then when they all come together within the set, all of a sudden you have this rainbow effect and the ability of the movement of these characters to kind of affect the compositional nature of theater that we're looking at uh, movement of colors and, and, and how, you know, if they mix and suddenly become kind of um, nondescript that it's just this sea of color but then when they you know certain groups of actors that are all the same color get together you get this kind of rainbow effect that is really lovely to see uh there was a big part of that also they staged like the noah play within the frame of, of world war one which was really fascinating um and a few other things like that that just really capture they're not using medieval dress but there's some aspects of it that signal medieval dress without being that um and clearly they're 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 using some props and some aspects of costume that gesture to more modern context without necessarily having to firmly fit the whole performance within that time period, say, you know, the World War I in this case. Um, but, but nonetheless still reads for the audience. Like we know, oh yeah, that's a, you know, that's a rifle from that time period. That's a dress that a woman would wear in 1918 and so on and so forth. Uh, so that you know that, but you, and you all of a sudden you're flooded with all of your experiences with learning about World War I 
uh, particularly if you're um, uh, from England and, and kind of what that means in that context. Uh, and so you, you're, you're, you're experiencing all of that even just by a prop or a costume without having to completely make the whole scene or the whole play about World War I in a medieval way. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much, um, yeah, that was a very, very influential work for me um, in being able to see kind of the compositional nature of medieval drama as being more effective and affective too uh, than, um, than just trying to uh, be medieval about it or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I just can't thank you enough for all your generosity and all the things you've shared with us tonight. It's really been um, an incredible experience to think about um, medieval theater in this way. So thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. Um, thank you. This is a pleasure. Great. Wonderful. So as we end, um, I want to thank all of our speakers for the first annual Helen D'Amico Memorial Lecture Series. Carol Symes, Karen Seilen, Laura Weigert, and tonight's Kyle A. Thomas, thank you so much. We've learned so much about medieval theater and dance. Our eyes can now envision the ephemeral world of medieval performance, and we thank you so much. Thank you to all um, of our audience for sticking with us through technical issues and new format. And as always coming to our lecture series with the greatest sense of engagement and amazing questions. We miss you and we'll see you next year or at another event soon. Take care, thanks so much. Good night, everyone.